Okay, this is unit two of the intermediate course. There are basically two types of statistical studies. One is the analytical or the um, um, inferential study, and that's where you take a sample, and based on that sample, then you try to uh, draw conclusions about the population. Well, you know, what's the whole population? It's the inference, measures its validity. These are like um, polls and presidential elections, um, Nelson ratings, things like that. The other one is enumerative or descriptive studies. Basically, you just take data that can be counted. Basically, there's only two things you get. You get the uh, average and standard deviation, how much it varies. We actually want to work more with the analytical. We don't want to look at everything, but we do want to take enough samples so that we can draw a, a valid inference about the population. And these analytical studies, they're not, they're not done haphazardly. You've got to do some certain steps. First, you've got to figure out what your problem you're going to study. Is it a one-tail or a two-tail? We're going to work, focus on two-tail with Greenbelt. Basically, it can shift both ways. Uh, we form a hypothesis. What do we think is going to happen? We do a test statistic. And how much we want, that's the alpha risk. And we'll talk about that a bit. Crunch the numbers. Draw our conclusions. And then we talk about it. If, if you're not seeing something like this before, this is how you draw uh, the formula for average using additional notation. And this came about because of computers. But basically, if you look at the top, you see that little capital sigma with the n and the i equal to 1. What you do is you add up all the uh, summation of all the different components in that group or that sample. And then you divide it by the sample size, and that's your average. And if you look at the dispersion, what you got is the standard deviation. That sigma, that's uh, basically the population. And then notice on the de uh, uh, denominator, it's got a capital N, use the entire population size. And this is the way statistics were done up to about 120 years ago. But uh, sigma, and then you sum up all the difference between the individual components, and that mu is the average of the population. You square to get rid of the negatives. Divide it by the population size, then take the square root again, and that's standard deviation. If you're talking about a sample, there's a bit of a fudge factor. Uh, it's called the basal correction, but instead of using the, the entire count, use n minus 1, and that's for sample size, something less than the population. These are the standard deviations. So in order to do uh, inferential studies, we start with descriptive statistics, and here they are, the two that we were, we're most concerned about. The central, uh, the cent where it's centered, and how much it disperses. Pause it and just read this to yourself. Um, but, but basically, what this thing is saying, this is the central limit theorem. Now, what it's telling us is basically the, the larger our sample size, the better it models the actual population. All right, and we're going to see how much better it accurately how much better it does model that. Well, what we do is instead of taking like the individual's uh, readings, we'll say you take a sample of about five, take the average of that, and then we just uh, take another sample of five, take the average of that. We start plotting these averages instead of the individuals, and then we can calculate the sample standard deviation of the means. And that's sigma x uh, sub x bar, which is equal to the individual standard deviation divided by the standard de or the square root of the sample size. Okay, and this will always yield a normal curve. You can see that we can start honing in on the true population by a factor of the square root of uh, the sample size. Quick example. Uh, the temperature is uh, averages 87.3 degrees with a standard deviation of 1.2 to 3 degrees. Estimate our standard deviation of the means for a four-year sample. So in this case, we take our formula. We've got the uh, standard deviation of the individuals, 1.23 degrees. And our sample size is four, four years. So it's 1.23 divided by the square root of four, or 0.62. So you can see we went from a, a variation of 1.23 if we look at individuals. Since we're talking about the means, we can hone in on this to 0.62. This is the sample standard deviation for the means.
let's start talking about probability. Um, basically, what we're going to do for the rest of uh, Six Sigma, or the, or the course, is we're going to uh, calculate what's called the p-value. What the p-value represents is the probability that the variation that I've seen is just caused by random chance. And we'll get more into that. But the p-value, how much it will vary just by random chance versus something really happened. So all probability is is chances favoring divided by the total chances. Okay, so if you got a simple event, one that can't be broken down anymore, like a roll of a single die, the probability of rolling a two on a on the die is equal to one in six. There's a one in six chance you're gonna do it. We can roll this enough to prove that it's a one in six chance long term. And we could have compound events. It's composition of two or more events. Again, using the dice example, we roll it two times, what's the probability of getting an eight on those two rolls? Another example, roll a dice and, uh, and toss a coin. What's the probability of getting a two and heads? Try to work that out on your own. Look, see if you can find the example. If you can't, uh, somebody uh, put this in a discussion. I'll do a video on it and show you how to do it. A couple compositions. There's either the union or the intersection. A union is if we toss a die, what's the probability of rolling a number less than four or an odd number? So it, what it is, it combines uh, the two, or is being the key word. So less than four would be like one, two, three. Odd numbers would be one, three, five. So under the conditions we just stated in the union, one, two, three, five would all satisfy that condition. Uh, there are six possibilities, you know, therefore four out of six or four divided by six would be the mean. Uh, that there'd be a 0.67 or 67% chance of getting a one, two, three, or a five. Just on a single dice. An intersection is if we toss a dice, what is the probability of rolling a number less than four and, and and being the key word, it being an odd number. Again, one, two, three is less than four. The odd numbers would be one, three, and five. So only two numbers, one and three, would satisfy both conditions. So there are two numbers, six possibility, two out of six, or a 33% chance, or one out of three chance of getting it. Uh, some different relationships, a complement. Uh, if you have some event, say it's A, has a certain probability of occurring other than B, uh, what would happen if A doesn't occur, then B is complement of A. So, example, the probability of a team will win is 0.43 or 43%. His complement is the probability that will not win, or 1 minus 0.43 or uh, 0.57 or 57%. They all add up to 1 or 100%. And the next one is conditional, where one event has to occur before another one can occur. For example, it rains two days every, or two days every week. The probability of rain depends on whether it's cloudy day which happens three days a week. So what is the probability that will rain on a cloudy day? Well, two out of three or two-thirds. It has to be cloudy before it will rain. If any of you guys are blackjack uh, players, that's a conditional event. The odds change as each hand is, or each card is laid for the next hand. Mutually exclusive events, these are two events that uh, just can't happen at the same time. Like a toss of a coin is either heads or tails. It can't be heads or tails, or heads and tails. It's got to be heads or tails. Uh, the probability of obtaining a three and a, and a four on the toss of a single dice is mutually exclusive. You can't roll a three and a four at the same time, right? That probability is absolutely zero. This will be the uh, only time you'll ever see me do an event relationship. Um, are the events mutually exclusive, complementary, independent, or dependent? So, for example, uh, I'm going to call if I roll one, two, or three on a die. I'm going to call that um, event A. If I roll one, three, or five, I'm going to call that event B. So we're going to uh, see if it's going to do a check. Does the probability of A, given that B has happened, equal the probability of A by itself? Again, does the probability of A occurring if B has already happened equal the probability of A? And that's going to be our check. Okay, so let's go through this slowly, okay? Given the probability of A, given that B has occurred, is equal to the probability of A, and that little upside down U is intersection, 
A intersect with B divided by the probability of B by itself. And we know from our examples that the probability of A intersect with B is 2 out of 6. There are, three, there are two numbers that, that are in the same group. The probability of rolling the three numbers in B is 1 and uh, 1 half, so I get a 2 thirds. The probability of A is also 3 out of 6 or 1 half. Therefore, the probability of A occurring that, given that B has occurred, does not equal the probability of A. So by definition, events A and B are dependent. Think about that a bit. But by definition, just by definition, they're dependent. So if they don't equal, they're dependent. If they were to equal, they would be independent. So we're going to do what's called the additive law. And again, the key word here is or. If the two events are not mutually exclusive, in other words, they are basically um, uh, independent. So given the probability of A union with B, that's what that U means, is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. We talked about that. For example, if two cars each have a probability of starting on a cold day is 0.7, what's well, the probability at least one will start? We just plug and chug. And if you get to the quiz, there's a question similar to this. I'll have a video, see if it makes sense. There's probably an easier way to do it. But look for the video on this. But this is the way you do it strictly in math terms. Now, if the two events are just mutually exclusive, then this the formula reduces down to the probability of A plus probability of B. For an example, if you reach into a drawer in a dark room, the probability of finding a black sock is 0.2 or 20%. The probability of finding a blue sock is 40% or 0.4. What's the probability of finding a blue or a black sock? Well, you just add the two together, 60%. Now, if you see the word and in the, uh, in the, the problem statement, then we've got to do this uh, equation. If two events are dependent, and the probability of the event of A influence the probability of event B, this is a conditional probability. So you, the way you read that for the probability of A given that B has happened is equal to the probability of A intersect with B divided by the probability of B and P of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A given B that happens as times the probability of B. Whew. Whew. If, if you want me to, if somebody asks, if this doesn't make sense, and I'll, uh, let me see if I can make this easier too on a video. For example, a shipment of 50 cell phones contains five defective units and two samples are pulled, uh, event A and event B. What's the probability of finding both defective? We plug and chug and find that is 80.186%, less than 1%. Again, if you want me to, somebody ask and I'll, I'll be glad to go on the board. But I want you to see the official math way to do it. And mathematicians tend to make things hard. So this engineer will try to make it easier for you. Now, if, the, if they're not conditional, in other words, they're independent, uh, again, it's, um, for, for example, if probability of A intersect B reduces down to the probability of A times probability of, of B. So the example here is the salesman has a probability of completing an order correctly 0.9 or 90% of the time. The ship department has a probability of shipping on 0.8 or 80% of the time. Again, what happens in shipping does not depend on what happens with the, uh, the uh, salesman. What is the probability that the order will ship on time with the correct event? Well, that reaches down to 0.9 times 0.8 or 0.72 or 72% of the time. Again, if you, you want this drawn out, just let me know.